Hi, my name is Robin Jeffries. Um, I'm in the uh, ads quality metrics group, but I'm a I'm sort of in that particular group. I'm their token HCI person, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a variety of things going on at Google in the HCI area at this uh, at this point. Um, so. Where is our research on HCI? So we're kind of uh, spread out all over, which is fairly typical for Google. Um, uh, we don't just sort of put the, the research in one place and expect others to come to us. We distribute the people in uh, lots of different places. So in Google research itself, we're sort of um, uh, gathering a critical mass. We've got some work on activity-based computing that I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, some stuff looking at our, you know, we have this large book scanning project, and how would you allow users to sort of follow the thread of an idea across multiple books and different perspectives on it? Um, some things on very large-scale social networks. Um, pardon? Uh, oh, that, yes, that's the problem with this. <laughs> All right. uh, very large scale social networking models, mobile and social search, and some very nascent work on uh, 3D for the web. Um, in search quality and ads quality, we're very interested in how people search and how they interact with search results pages. So we don't see ads as kind of a separate thing. We see it as part of the searching experience and hopefully po a positive part of the searching experience. Um, and again, you'll hear um, something from, from that area about search. Um, and then we have a fairly large user experience group that's primarily working on products, but um, um, you know, partly through the 20% project idea, partly just through things we decide to invest in. Um, there are things that spin off that you know, become sort of research worthy. So we've done some work in new methods, new approaches for um, gathering data about users, uh, interaction patterns, and uh, trying to validate uh, the value of them. Um, and a fair amount of ethnographic work kind of looking at either existing customers or potential uh, customers of Google and what kind of things they're doing in their life that that we could satisfy those needs. And um, that will be one of the ones I'll talk to you about uh, uh, potential Google users in Uganda. Um, so as I said, it's sort of a whirlwind tour of three projects. Um, the first one is what's an expert searcher? Um, the next one is how, how can Google search make a difference in Uganda? And then how can we support extended complex information finding activities? Okay. So what makes someone an expert searcher? So this is primarily the work of Dan Russell, who's sitting back there and who's going to take all the questions on this topic, <laughs> aren't you? Uh, so, and uh, so um, Anders Ericsson, who's uh, spent his career studying expertise in a variety of areas, talks about how people ramp up in this expertise level till they reach what they think of as an acceptable level, when they think they're good enough. And then beyond that, further improvements are really unpredictable and some people just never get past the good enough stage and some people become the world class uh, whatever it is that uh, you're thinking about and this does not seem to be just number of years of practice there seem to be particular things you have to do so I um, thought I'd start by asking you some questions um, so one of the skills you need to know to be a good searcher is to know what's out there. You know, is it worth your time even searching for something? So I'll ask you if you'd raise your hand to see if you believe you could find um, the answer to these questions. So um, do you think you could find a picture of Terry Winograd? <laughs> All right. Okay. We start with an easy one. Okay. Uh, can you find a picture of Rula Lenska? Uh, <laughs> All right. To give you a clue, she's a British actress who's also a Polish countess, and you may have seen her in just flaming red hair, and you may have seen her in hair commercials. Uh, so. All right. Uh, can you find a picture of your grandmother? All right. Can you find a picture of my grandmother? Okay. If I told you that there was a picture of my grandmother on the web, do you think you could find it? Can you find a picture of Ted or a video of Ted Williams hitting a home run? Okay, so okay. And can you find a video of my grandmother hitting up? <laughs> so there were, there were things you were pretty confident that you couldn't find, and probably because you believed they weren't out there. Um, and then there were others that, uh, you know, there actually was quite a variation in this group about what you thought you'd be able to find. So that kind of knowledge, both about what is out there and what skills you have for finding them, is uh, an example of the kind of expertise that we've been looking at. So. 
what we discover about people is that by and large, they don't really have a very good model of how Google works. We, we ask a question sort of like, you know there's that box on the home page, you type something in there and you press return and then you get a page of results. What happens between the time you press return and you see those results? And it's really hard, I mean, to get anything coherent out of people, anything that, that we, and, and it certainly doesn't look like, well, there's an index of all these words and it's found in these particular ways. Um, uh, and that people, because they don't have that model, they don't have anything they can use to predict what will happen. I mean, their, their predictions are not based on any kind of an underlying model. Um, and so surprising <laughs> things happen to them all the time and they just cope. It, it doesn't stop them from using it. Um, but we found that this is true both our work has been with kind of average searchers asking these kinds of questions. Uh, David Hendry's work has done something very similar with first year computer science uh, students and they're not significantly different in their um, imaginative models, um, you know, then a miracle happens is kind of the nature of the model. Yeah, if uh, you can either go to the thing or I can repeat the question if it's going to be a short run. But I mean, people don't have functional models of how a car works. Most people don't know how an engine works, but they know that if they press accelerator, the car, car goes faster and they press the brake, it goes slower. <laughs> so people might not be able to explain how the search engine behind Google works, yet they might have a mental model that the terms have appeared in the pages and the yeah, well, well, no, it, it's even more so than that. So, um, yeah, they do. They, they, if you can get them to talk about any kind of a model, it may not be that uh, the terms have to appear, appear on the pages and things like that. They may have a, um, as you'll see in at least one or two examples, I think you'll see that um, the terms they're using are not terms that they would necessarily expect to appear on the page that would resolve. Um, clearly it is related to the idea that yes with a car you know you know that that gas pedal makes the car go and that brake pedal makes the car stop and your model isn't much deeper than that or at least I don't know about your model but there are people who drive cars successfully with a model that isn't much deeper than that but um, uh, at least in terms of articulating the models we don't even get kind of you know this is go this is stop kind of uh, models and there certainly are behaviors that would suggest that they haven't thought it through even enough to have models at the, at that level of complexity. But they're getting along just the way the person that only knows that you push the accelerator or the brake pedal gets along just fine driving um, until, of course, they're stranded on the freeway with a you know, something wrong. <laughs> oh. um, so what might be the behavioral hallmarks of an expert searcher? So we've looked at a variety of things that uh, might represent, uh, you know, the, might distinguish those who are more successful from those that aren't. Um, you know, time till their first click, time to result, uh, uh, first result or final result, uh, ability to handle either long-term or multiple searches or keep track of state and things like that. And those, while um, they are um, you know, we see those kinds of behaviors. They're not as good at separating out um, the, the experts from the average searchers, as you might think. Um, Ann Aula, who is now at Google, but this is what she did for her dissertation, um, found in looking at expertise in, among her population that speed of query iteration, query length, uh, obviously, um, more experts use longer queries. That's been a consistent finding. Um, that, how precise their queries are and how quickly they can evaluate the results were the kinds of things that she saw as consistent differences in experts. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple of studies we've done and then how that led to the model that we're trying to use to, to continue our work and figure out how this can impact search. Um, so this is something we looked at 23 searchers. Um, they all work for Google and because of their jobs we had reason to believe that they ought to qualify as expert searchers. Um, and we collected a lot of data from them. Um, just one measure, these people are doing about eight searches a day. The average Google user does about eight to nine <coughs> searches a week. So uh, at least in terms of the amount of time they're spending searching, that's, um, they're, they're clearly serious searchers. Um, one of the things we found is the kinds of tasks that they do are different from the, uh, uh, the, the average searcher. So we have this way of classifying tasks into categories and they're kind of what 
you'd think those words would mean. Um, we typically find that find simple and navigate um, are the most common. They kind of fight for which one's on top when we look at broader populations. Um, but these people are you know, primarily doing these fine complex, they, they, there's a single answer, but it's going to take more than just uh, visiting one page and finding one sentence to get to it. And the number of explore learn is a lot higher than we see in, in other samples. But when you look at the length of their searches, um, this curve, um, I could produce an almost identical curve involving average searchers. That is, um, they're getting, they're doing more complex searches, but they're getting to the answer in about the same amount of steps as the people doing the simpler searches. So it's that kind of ability to focus in and get to the answer quickly. That's at least one hallmark of their expertise. So uh, informed by kind of some of this stuff, we went out and did a series of field interviews with expert searchers. And so there are 27 of these people. Um, with half of them, we showed up about a week early, and we installed some software on their computer that logged all their searches. And then part of the interview was to go back over that week's worth of data and have them tell us about what they were doing, what their experiences were. Um, and then for everybody, we asked them about their typical experiences, about particularly challenging searches they had dealt with. And we gave them some sort of tasks we have found have been um, uh, have given us interesting information about how people approach searching. Um, we recruited them based on their um, describing themselves as an expert searcher. So we, we went out and said, we're looking for expert searchers. You think you're an expert? Come talk to us. Um, we got librarians. We got people who do searching and finding for a living. Um, so they uh, might be someone who does research for um, um, you know, a, a publication of some sort or for a law firm, or it might be uh, one of them was someone who was a professional organizer, and the things she had to find were uh, container-like things for her clients and, and things to hold different types of tchotchkes and stuff like that. And, and um, so she could find those sort of everywhere. Um, and one example was someone who was a you know, marathon bargain hunter, was not willing to pay more than an extra five cents for anything she bought, and she could find the lowest price on the web anywhere. Um, an interesting thing is all of these people showed some evidence of expert behavior, things where we would go, wow, you know, that's impressive mixed in with evidence of what I'll call amateur behavior, um, that they looked um, uh, indistinguishable from, we've done a lot of interviews before with sort of more average searchers. So there was nobody we encountered that was sort of consistently um, always looking expert. And it was kind of inside their comfort zone. They were very expert. When you move them outside of it, um, they kind of lost some of these skills. So to give you two examples, um, this is from an average searcher. It's a previous study. Um, so she's a school teacher, and they're doing a unit on astronomy. And she says, I need to find out where the planets are going to be in the night sky tonight for my class. We want to be able to find Jupiter and Mars if we can. And she types in constellations. And, uh, and then she, when she looks at it, oh, this doesn't seem to have anything about planets on it. So uh, her expectation about what's going to get her to useful pages is obviously, from her results, not consistent with how Google works. Um, now, our expert searcher, on the other hand, I want to find an MP3 or some kind of a song for a Beatles tune. So this is obviously not somebody doing this for her day job. She's learned this in some other context. So what she's doing there is that she's looking for pages that are directory listings. And she knows that those will have um, index of as part of the title. So she used the in title attribute to look for index of. She then says, I want them to be MP3s or MP4s or AVIs. But I don't want HTML, HTM, or PHP files. Um, and, uh, and then Beatles, because that's the topic she's looking for. Now, this is a pattern that she has learned. but. You know, she's learned it through a, a lot of trial and error and, and has gotten good. And of course, I, whoa, there's lots of stuff in here. She gets exactly uh, what she's looking for. Uh, so th those were kind of the, the kinds of variations we saw in people in terms of uh, a variety of these abilities. And so um, this has led to this kind of a model where um, we're sort of looking at both how we can better serve these expert users and how um, we can help average users to behave like expert users because we're giving them a little more scaffolding. Um, 
So there's your pure engine technique. That's what we saw in this last searcher. Um, you know how to use these various operators. You know when to use double quotes. You know when to use minus. Um, there's information mapping. How do I, what do I use to translate from the way I'm currently thinking about things to where the answer is going to be? Um, knowing about the concept of a reverse dictionary. Um, knowing things like, you know, you may or may not trust Wikipedia in this domain, but it's really handy to go and learn the vocabulary. And you may find that the word you're using, that there's a synonym that's going to produce a lot more results. Um, knowing what kinds of things are likely to be out there, as, as um, we talked about uh, earlier. Um, then, then there's the domain knowledge. Um, you know, what do you know about a particular domain? We had one searcher who was in the medical field. I've sort of forgotten what his actual, whether he was a doctor or a medical researcher. Um, when he was searching on medical topics, you know, he was just amazing. Um, when we gave him some of our problems that were outside the medical domain, he just sort of seemed to lose all those skills and wasn't able to, uh, to apply them in new topics. Um, um, search strategy. So this is really kind of metacognitive skills. Um, when do you, you know, give up on one strategy and shift to another? When, it, when are you sort of casting a wide net? When do you focus and narrow down? How do you figure out you might as well give up? It, the information doesn't seem to be there. Um, assessing what you get. Um, is it believable? Um, there's a lot of crap out there on the internet, and how do you know whether you found the, uh, uh, an accurate answer to what you're looking for? Um, how does it relate to the things? You know, does it contradict what you already know? How do, how do you build up a, 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 an entire coherent answer as you get different pieces? Um, and then there are a lot of things around site-specific knowledge. Uh, when you get to Amazon, uh, how do you find the reviews? Um, there are various sites that will allow you to you know, give you long lists of things, but you can filter or sort them in ways that will be more useful to you. Um, and, and those are important to know. Um, so that leads to this as um, the current model that uh, we're working on. So um, the next project is this uh, ethnography and rapid prototyping of mobile information services in Uganda. And that's Sean Townsend and uh, Charles Warren were the primary people on this one. Um, so Africa um, you know, is a really different place in terms of infrastructure, particularly computing and data infrastructure. Um, there's very limited bandwidth. Uh, on the west coast of Africa, there are some undersea cables that will actually give them access to the rest of the world. But on the east coast, they don't even have that. And the availability of landlines and you know, just uh, lines going from point A to point B is very limited. Um, so both for voice and data, mobile is really what they've got. And um, this is a little broader than Africa, but you know, 61 percent of the mobile phone users are in developing countries as compared to 10 percent of the uh, uh, internet users on the planet. So um, they're a world that's really for the foreseeable future um, going to be driven by mobile. And they may be leading the way for all of us to be doing things on mobile. Um, so Google puts as our mission, uh, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And um, this is sort of working on the universally part. Um, this project actually was um, primarily Sean's 20% project. So this is her attempt to, um, she did it in collaboration with Google.org and um, to, to take a chance to do a really interesting project that was going to make a difference in the world, or at least so we hope. Um, so what they did, um, they trained 12 researchers, um, locals, um, and sent them off to 17 different locations in Uganda, um, trying to look for sort of extreme locations and locations where they might find uh, people who, for this would be useful. Um, they interviewed over 200 people in four days, so it was definitely a marathon activity. Uh, and they had these people use the phone to make queries. So they interviewed them about their information needs, what they did with phones and things. And if they had a mobile phone of their own, they asked them to use their own phone. If they didn't, because in a lot of uh, Uganda, people um, rent a phone for a call. There's you know, somebody in the neighborhood who has a phone, and you can go and use it for a charge. Um, then they had a phone that they would lend to these people. And they could make queries about the weather, about agriculture or about health. Those are, those are the three categories that they use. 
and they got 286 queries, and this was a Wizard of Oz simulation. So if you're not familiar with that, it's sort of there's a man behind the curtain is the idea, and these are the men behind the curtain. Um, the queries were real SMS queries, but they went into a station where there are these guys, and if you can see, they've each got their two computers, one of which is where the SMS message is coming in, another one is they're madly doing research where they were given a set of sources um, particularly useful for the local situation, and then they type back the answer, carefully making it fit in the 160 character limit and things like that. Um, so um, that's how we dealt with, you know, there were no algorithms were harmed in the doing of this experiment. It was all human beings. So, um, so really fascinating uh, 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 things of, of list of queries. So what do I do after a, st uh, a snake bite? Um, uh, you know, I have a headache and constipation. What can I do? So people had lots of really, you know, Im important questions that they wanted to ask. Um, here are some examples of kind of the situations and the kinds of queries. So um, this one, they wanted to know the weather in Jenga. And the answer is, 2nd of February, hot sunny intervals, five day forecast, hot chance of evening rain showers. Uh, this one is, uh, what well, like to know how Ebola is spread in Uganda. Uh, Ebola is spread through bodily fluid contact with infected patients, dead people, and primates. The outbreak in Uganda has been contained. Um, this is actually my favorite tomato wilt. I'm a gardener. I thought maybe I could learn something about what to do about my tomatoes. Um, and clearly a local solution. To control pests on tomatoes, get human urine, ferment for two weeks, add water at a ratio of one to two, mash cabbage leaves, and add to the mixture. <laughs> so that's why your tomatoes aren't doing well. <laughs> and um, I'd like to know why some people's foots are smelling, yet they are clean. Uh, if your feet are still smelling after they've been washed, you may have a fungal infection or your socks may be dirty or damp. So a wide range of questions that we got from this. Um, and there were a lot of insights here. So we're, we're at the, you know, what are we going to do about it stage and no products have been released, so um, I can't tell you that. But um, there was a lot of what kinds of things were they asking that they weren't just asking these kind of rhetorical questions like, you know, when should I get my next tetanus shot? They were asking questions um, that were really immediate kinds of medical or, or agricultural you know, quest questions of immediate importance to them, even in this situation where, um, you know, there were just a stranger comes up and says, would you like to ask the computer a question? Um, the perceived privacy of the mobile phone was clearly a very important asset, that they could do this in a context where, um, you know, they wouldn't have to broadcast it to a lot of other people. Um, we found that there wasn't a lot of experience with SMS, even among the people who own mobile phones, that they're pretty much, um, because you're often calling someone who doesn't have a mobile phone, there's this kind of, you know, uh, arrangement to make sure both of you have a phone at a particular time. That's a lot easier to do in the voice domain than the text domain, and so um, they just weren't using SMS as much. Um, there were illiteracy illiteracy is going to be uh, an important challenge here. Not all of these people were literate, particularly in English. Um, and they spoke multiple languages. English is a second language for a lot of them. And uh, these were the kinds of questions that were a lot more comfortable asking in their native language. So those were some of the findings. Um, it was really clear that this would be very valuable to people, that there was, this was information that they couldn't easily get by other sources that were local to them. So um, we're, we're really interested in trying to figure out what we can do to make this available to people. Um, so the last project is our user activity research. Um, so it's Peter Hong, Deepa Kumar, Jiahu Lu and Elin Peterson are the, the group doing this work. Um, so what they want to do is improve the user experience by incorporating context and uh, in a variety of ways. So this is sort of a research program, a lot of which is just getting started. Um, using things like relationships between objects to help you with, um, uh, you know, find the things that are important to your current tax, task. Um, 
deal with distractions. You know, there's a lot of data that suggests we're getting distracted multiple times a minute. Um, well, how do you turn those into something that's useful, uh, particularly when you need the information later on? Um, and then um, looking at different ways of allocating the workload between the computer and the human and basing that on sort of some of the recent uh, neuroplasticity, neuroscience models of human memory and perception. So to sort of set the stage, um, a typical computer layout for probably for many of us. Um, so this user is searching, they're IMing, they're blogging, they're listening to music, and they just answered the phone. And Google, at least, and probably m any you know things that we're trying to ca capture information to be useful to this yeah, user recognizes the search click. But there's all this other stuff that's going on. So how could we get? a better sense of this person's activity so as to be able to help them either in the moment now or later on when they're trying to figure out what was that what was that blog post or what was that stuff I was searching for when I was doing that blog entry or something of that sort. So the, the first category is this use of these relationships um, to help you find things um, either that you've seen before or that, that other people have seen. Um, so the data suggests that about 30% of the objects you touch are, you know, electronic objects are objects you've touched before. So there's a lot of possibility if we can figure out which of those objects you're interested in based on patterns in the, uh, in, in the things you're doing right now that we could be very useful to you. Um, so um, uh, there are actually a uh, paper f from the most recent IUI conference and the recall workshop on using these uh, related objects and how that can be useful to people. Um, another is relatedness of, across users. So using a lot of things about your activity not to, uh, to predict what kind of news you're likely to, to want to use. So it's not just in classic recommender systems where, um, well, if you like Britney Spears articles here or the other people who like Britney Spears articles and what they like, it's um, based on maybe things like videos you watched or um, uh, other kinds of activities that um, you did uh, on the internet. Can we predict what kind of news that you'll be most interested in? Um, then the, the the difference between distraction and serendipity. Um, so when you do get interrupted, um, how do we help you get back to what you're doing, and how do we help you not lose the, in the uh, the semantic, you know, the the mental sense, the information you have um, the, during the distraction. Um, and this um, started from some user research looking at uh, what happens to people and how they get distracted and and what their pass through an activity look like. And so we found there was a lot of complexity in these paths where they looped around, got a distraction, came back, uh, did, worked on the same thing, uh, distracted again, which led to this distraction, which led to this distraction. I, I love the phrase serial distractions. The uh, similarity to serial killer does not go <laughs> on. Um, a lot of these distractions are kind of outside what the computer has access to. Um, so you may get a phone call, that's that. But they usually leave some sort of a trace on, uh, in the activity trail. Um, so you may get a phone call that asks, uh, uh, what's the address of the restaurant we're going to have dinner tonight? Um, and you go to um, the website of the, of the restaurant or to Maps or something like that and find it. Um, so it, you know, if you needed to come back and find out about that restaurant, a week later, there's something there that we could be helpful. The problem is how do we separate that out? Because if it just gets sort of attached to whatever task you were doing before then, then we just have noisier data about that task. But if we can segment it correctly, we can do something useful with that. Um, and then another thing that was clear was there are, most people set up their workstations so they're doing one thing at a time. So every time they get distracted, they kind of have to shut down that stuff, close those windows, and open up another set of windows. And is there some way to enable the, those kind of more graceful transitions between them? So the current project here is called Playlist, and it's sort of taking streams of events that are sort of associated with a particular task, even though they may not be contiguous in time, and using um, the objects and things that were used with that as kind of a peripheral awareness that you could look over and uh, saying that this event was related to what you're doing now, and here are some of the objects in them. If you need access to those, what would you uh, find useful? 
Um, so what we'd like to be able to do is this uh, you know, multi-tasking uh, uh, user here is to be able to capture all of that information and help them be able to do a better job of it. So another aspect of the same work is kind of the approach. So they're, they're trying to do this in a fairly disciplined way um, where it's a multidisciplinary team of user researchers, designers, and developers. Um, and they do something that Elon is calling a collaboration con contract of deciding you know, what's, what's the value for the user that they're working on. And then rather than kind of being three separate mini projects where everybody goes off with, by themselves or with other people in their discipline and does things, they're you know, trying to keep it very tightly multidisciplinary, but choices of priorities, of uh, uh, what they're gonna, you know, wh how they're going to do things are sort of always done with their eye on that prize of what is it we're trying to do for the user. And um, that you know, keeps everybody focused in the same direction. Um, so the, the researchers are bringing ethnographic methods to discover what the potential opportunities are. The design is sort of being done from looking at extreme cases that are discovered by the researchers and you know, what could we do in those extreme cases, but also starting from fairly minimal prototypes and iterating into something richer. Um, the developers are committed to creating prototypes that can be deployed in these minimalist and iterative things so we ac actually get user feedback at each step of the way. They're, they're things that someone could actually use. And then that's used by everybody to help them iterate and come up with new things in their area. Um, so the, the projects are sort of as much a test of this methodology as they are of the, the actual um, areas that they want to explore. Um, so that was my whirlwind tour for you, and uh, I can take any questions or questions about other aspects of HCI at Google. Um, a, okay, uh, there there are a lot more things going on, but um, obviously this was <laughs> as this was fairly whirlwind. Um, yeah, can you uh, maybe we can bring it? Yeah, could you bring it to her? That might be the easiest. Thanks. Just a clarification. I really liked the Uganda project. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, you, uh, the people who did the study, divided the topics that the people could ask questions about into agriculture, health, and what was the third? Weather. Was Weather. It. And do you have a feel for which one uh, most people asked? Was it mostly health? Health got a really large amount because it sort of everybody had health questions. I mean, cl farmers tended to have weather questions, uh, I mean, uh, uh, agriculture questions. And weather turned out to be an interesting thing. It, it really turned out to be a subtopic of agriculture because you don't need to ask, what's the temperature going to be like tomorrow? Um, the temperature tomorrow is going to be the same as it was today, and six months from now it'll be the same as it was today. Um, but rain and extreme weather things were really important, and they're particularly important in uh, agricultural type uh, settings. So. Um, that, but health, everybody is impacted by health, yes. Hi, this is, this is about the expert versus naive users. Um, I think uh, people are actually very motivated to become expert uh, searchers. And uh, if you go to the Google site now, there's actually almost no information on how to become an expert searcher. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's something that, that could really use some research, is just how do you give people some good examples, good tutorial. Even if you go to the advanced search button, there's very few examples of, oh, here's good ideas for you know, how to think about your problem and, and become an expert searcher. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of uh, people in the tech industry think, well, no one ever reads user manuals, but that's actually not true if you look at the statistics. People over time actually do get around to uh, it, it being motivated in a lot of problems to uh, become good and then they tell their friends and so on. So I, I think there's yeah, uh, an opportunity not just to look at the software but to essentially look at the documentation. Yeah. And, and I th we agree. I mean that was partly to sort of understand where were the opportunities to provide help. And a, uh, an interesting place to go is that while Google doesn't have a lot of help and it's kind of a historical thing of kind of wanting um, it's sort of to force the engineers in the direction of, no, you can't release this feature by saying, I know it's hard, but I'll put it in the documentation. Um, you know, assume there will be no documentation and make it usable at that level. So 
whether we found the right sweet spot in that is always debatable. But you'll find on things like YouTube and other places um, uh, videos that teach you how to do things with Google Search. And there are these, you'll find them in people's blogs. There are just lots of places you can go. Now, they're not well aggregated. Um, but yeah, I think the fact that there's kind of a cottage industry in helping people become better searchers um, is um, uh, definitely evidence that what you say is true. Sort of following up on that question, there's a lot of research in the cognitive psychology and education literature on this a novice expert shift. And one of the main things I know that I've heard there is this so-called self-explanation effect that if you get students to really explain to themselves, well, why did they get these results and, 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 and try to get them to think deeper about it, that that's one of the best things that they've found in terms of trying to convert people from novices to experts. I'm just curious within this sort of you know, web search environments, anyone's ever tried that sort of thing or looked into that literature for clues on yeah. how to convert people from novice to experts? Not as a manipulation. We certainly um, see people when they're trying to explain to us why they got the results they did, um, kind of uh, getting new ins insights. So uh, uh, a common thing we, we've seen is that the minus operator tells you, I don't want that word. And people will put a space between the minus and the, the word afterwards. And uh, it does essentially nothing if you do that. And, uh, and they will then tell us that this is what it's doing, um, completely ignoring initially the evidence that that word is bolded on the page. That <laughs> and um, you know that those kinds of in those circumstances, um, you know, we've seen several people have these aha moments of, well, I guess it isn't working, and then why isn't it? Um, but as a manipulation, we sort of haven't figured out. It, it's not like we can send a researcher to everybody's home for an hour or a month or so um, to help them get better. So, um, but um, Dan, who does this work, one of his side projects is he goes around to the local schools and either teaches the students or the teachers how to become better searchers because there are a lot of teachers out there teaching bad searching. And, um, you know, this is sort of the equivalent of the teachers have to teach basic computer skills who were not exposed to them in any systematic way and are perpetuating those things. Well, the same thing is happening for searching. So, um, so in that kind of overtly teach the teachers, we, we are doing that in an uh, exploratory way. But yeah, uh, figuring out what we might be able to do that's kind of very much in the moment um, enables people to recognize that they have, because part of that explanation is uh, being, to rec being able to recognize the difference between what you wanted and what you got. And often people will say, I want X. They show us the search result page, it's full of Y, and they say, see, it worked. <laughs> and uh, that, that makes it much more challenging. Uh, are there more questions or comments? Gary, yeah. uh, we want the mic. <laughs> this kind of collaboration contract? That, that, collaboration uh, contracts, um, yeah, that Elon has. I mean, that's a very appealing idea to those of us who've been in HCI for a long time. It, is it starting to permeate the culture here? I mean, it's a very strong engineering culture here. Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, and this so, is a very different kind of idea about how to do yeah. these kinds of things. So she's done it with two project teams, and I think one of them has gotten far enough along that they're sort of starting to um, do it themselves. That is, you know, not not just kind of do what they're told, but kind of bring ideas to the table um, in in meetings where she's not there. It sort of tends to continue. Um, it's it's a I know that labor intensive is a while, but it takes a while to sell people. So it'll be interesting to see if over a couple of years of doing this, whether this uh, spreads at Google. Because you're right, it's not um, the traditional Google way of doing things. <laughs> How uh, did, for example, the U Uganda project get funded? Uh, it's just Curious to know. Um, you mentioned that it was a twenty one of the twenty percent uh, projects, and that's it's a wonderful uh, project. But it required quite a lot of resources to actually get it done in the field uh, there. So, so, how does something like that happen at Google? Well, so this one had a couple of partnerships, some of which I I can't completely tell you about, but one of them was with Google.org. And so certainly her f time was just, that's part of the 20% and, and her you know, flights going over there and stuff like that were funded out of her organization and um, 
thus far we are not so budget constrained that um, saying, well, you can do this 20% project, but you've got to you know, fly to Uganda on your own um, has not been an issue. Uh, but the training the other researchers and those things that are, are significant dollar outlay, um, that was sort of a collaboration among several partners. And um, uh, uh, I'm guessing that Google.org funded it, although I don't, um, uh, you know, it's at least the money parts of it, there were people who contributed their time from, from the partner organizations. Well, thank you very much. And, uh...